Good morning. Good morning. And welcome, 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 and a special welcome to all of you who are listening to this uh, or seeing this on YouTube, and particularly for those who I know who are in a hospital bed this morning or at home recuperating, know that I am praying for you and our congregation prays for you. Our service continues on page 355 of the Book of Common Prayer. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Grant to us, Lord, we pray, the spirit to think and do always those things that are right, that we who cannot exist without you may by you be enabled to live according to your will through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. A reading from the first book of Kings. At Horeb, the Mount of God, Elijah came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, what are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, 
I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left. They are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Haziel as king over Aram. Also, you shall, shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And you shall uh, anoint Elisha, son of Saphat, of Abel Meholah, as prophet in your place. Whoever escapes the sword of Haziel, Jehu will ki shall kill. And whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha, shall kill. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. The word of the Lord. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law, that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you on your lips and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew or Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who come on him, who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they to call on one in whom they are, have not believed? And how are they to believe in one whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? It is as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. The word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat battered by the waves was far from the land, for the wind was against them. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear, Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This morning we hear the story of Jesus walking on the water. And this story was originally taken from the Gospel of Mark, but it has a little bit, it it has something in it that Mark doesn't have, and that's Jesus walking. I'm sorry, that's Peter walking on the water. And so I want to back up a little bit. Why would Matthew, the writer of Matthew, include Peter in this story? And I think we have to think about why Matthew was writing. And so in broad strokes, let me just say that Matthew was concerned that the people understood and believed in the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of Satan. And so Matthew wanted people to have opportunities to see Jesus and to understand his relationship with the Father. Now, all this week, I just kept coming back to the words immediately. And you don't, you didn't hear it in the reading, but in the Bible, it begins, this section, this pericope begins, immediately Jesus commanded them. And in the NRSV, um, and other editions, other translations will say, after a meal, Jesus commanded them to get it. But in this particular edition, immediately appeared three times. And so I I was like, what is with immediately? Why is that so important? And so let's back up again. Why is Jesus where he is? Now, Jesus, you'll recall, has fed the 5,000. He's just performed this miracle. But prior to that miracle, he had gotten news that his good friend, John the Baptist, had been murdered, and he was on his way to spend time with the Father when all of the people saw him and followed him, and he had to sit down with them. And when it came late, you know the story. They divided up the bread, and they had more than enough bread, and so Jesus, having just performed this miracle, says to his disciples, Get in the boat and go. Now, this is a first. We generally don't hear Jesus telling the disciples to get in the boat first or to go ahead. Generally, Jesus will get in, and then the disciples will follow him. But immediately, well, Matthew is known for his temporal references, 
but why immediately? I kept wondering, you know, there are lots of, there are lots of parts of this passage that could speak to me, but this immediately just kept coming back to me. And this week was a busy week for me, and perhaps it was a busy week for you as well. And um, as on Saturday afternoon, which would be yesterday, as I was writing this, I have a dear friend who's in the hospital, and um, I wrote to her and said, I'm still in the water with Peter waiting to be pulled out. And my friend immediately wrote back, Jesus is going to pull you and me out. That's a promise. Jesus is going to pull you and me out. That is absolutely a promise. And that, just her saying that, the playfulness of that comment that Jesus is going to pull both of us out, settled my soul. So what was making my life so busy? Well, this week I had a nuclear stress test and um, to get my heart checked out. And at the same time I was having a nuclear stress test, the third of my five brothers was getting checked out for a blocked coronary artery. And, um, and so I went into it a little bit stressed. And when I came out, I asked the technician, they, they put contrast dye in you, and so the images of your heart appear. So I asked her, am I gonna glow like Moses coming down off the mountain when I walk out of here? Well, the older technician knew that story and she immediately started laughing and ran down the hall and I could hear her telling it to another technician there. That she knew that story. Well, the story we hear today about Peter walking on the water is, a, is often referred to in society, but if you don't know the story, then it doesn't make a lot of sense. And so our story of Peter walking on the water is, is one that has become rather classic. And so um, we're gonna delve into that, but. Well, I'm going to circle back around that. I want to go back to about why it was so busy. That on Thursday, there was marriage counseling, which I love to do. And this is for somebody outside our parish that will be getting married in Cumberland. And um, the groom is a graduate of Hampton, Sydney. And I know the bride from Redeemer. And, um, and I've asked permission to tell this story. As we sat outside Panera on Midlothian Turnpike, an accident occurred. And immediately, Farrell and Craig jumped into action. I mean, they did not waste a second. Farrell called 911 and Craig went to the scene without hesitation. And I stood there watching their dog. So, why did Matthew say immediately three times? I believe he was telling our listeners to not to wait. Don't wait. When God calls, go. And when we hear this pericope and hear Jesus saying to Peter, come, Peter did come, but when he looked down, he became fearful. Now, it doesn't say that he just went in and sank. It was while he was with Jesus, looking at Jesus, it wasn't till that large wave frightened him. And then he went down and he called out. And as believers since the beginning of time have done, Lord, help me. And if that phone calls for me, tell him I'm busy. I, I just, so immediately Jesus reached out his hand so why would Matthew include this story again? Because often we say the point of this lesson is if you take your eyes off Jesus, you'll sink. But I don't think it's just that. In fact, I don't believe that that is always true, that 
Jesus is going to hold all of us steady and all is going to be well. But Peter represents all believers. Peter represents all of us in his doubt. If, if it is you, if it is you, and now those were words the devil used in the temptation. If it is you, if it is you, then jump off this place. If it is you, Lord, make me walk. And Jesus said, come. And, but I believe that God was, or I'm sorry, I believe that Matthew in writing this wanted us to hear that everyone doubts at times. We all have periods of doubting. God, are you there? Is this really you? Will you truly save me? Is there any hope in this situation? And sometimes when we begin to feel that there is no hope, that's okay because that's human nature for us to question and wonder where is God and what what, if anything, is God doing? This passage has other threads that go back to the Old Testament, and we might see the presence of God as a continuation of the Moses story, when God parted the waters and the Israelites were able to cross the sea. That, that thread of calming the water. In biblical language, water was viewed as something very dangerous and it was part of the story to convey this was a big wave this was big water and Jesus conquered it another thread which is both theological and Christological is the I am statement you'll recall that Yahweh revealed to Moses I am who I am and the witness the disciples witnessed the divinity of Jesus as the Son of God, when Jesus said those words and calmed the storm. They were there. They saw it. This is what is known as a sea escape epiphany. The light began to shine on Jesus as Jesus calmed the water and they knew that it was indeed Jesus. It was indeed Jesus who pulled Peter out of the water and brought him back into the boat. But not just, not only did Peter believe, but all of the disciples now began to believe. As Matthew was trying to get believers then, I believe he's still trying to get believers today to believe that we have a call to act immediately. And it's nice to believe, but where are we being called? You know, we can't just sit on the shore and watch the other boats go by. We're all called to step out from time to time. When the accident happened outside of Panera, Farrell and Craig knew exactly what to do. There was no hesitation. Immediately they sprang into action. And I believe God is calling us to spring into action in the same way as we witness events in our society that we know are events that are not of the Lord, are not the best for God's people. There are many lessons we can learn from this gospel, and perhaps the first is that God is always with us. And for all sorts of reasons, we can step away and believe that God isn't here, that we can't hear him. And again, I just want to say, Doubt is a normal part of our faith. It is part of our faith journey. It is not the opposite of faith. Doubt is, is part of who we are as believers of God. In this passage, there were three entities, Jesus, Peter, and the disciples. Only Peter questioned, if it is you, Lord, tell me to come. And Jesus said simply, come. But everyone in that boat heard and saw, believed 
and worship Jesus. They didn't all need to agree on everything, but one thing they could agree on at that moment, that Jesus was the Son of God, and that God will make something happen with just one person. It doesn't take everybody. If we waited for everybody in our church to be in agreement on everything, we would never do anything. No, generally God speaks to each of us in a, in a still, small voice. Last week, one of our young people gave me an assortment of cutouts for my bulletin board. But before she handed me the envelope, she asked, is this your office? It's really pretty. In parish life, you all know, clergy are swamped from September through May, and a lot gets left out, sometimes on the counters, sometimes in piles on the desk, sometimes even on the floor. And I had been beating myself up that, up about that for a long time because May came along, a time when I would generally, May and June, but there were other family events that took me away, rightfully so, and so I hadn't done anything. But when I came into my office this week, I kept hearing that young voice say, it's really pretty. I looked around, not with critical eyes, as I had been doing for weeks. Every time I went in there, I went, oh, Nancy, I cannot believe you are leaving this like this. What a mess. You need to take care of this. But suddenly, I didn't hear that with critical eyes or see it as critically. I began to see it with gentle eyes and a gentle acceptance that, yes, it is a mess, and yes, it's time to start picking it up. It only takes one voice to move us. And like our gospel lesson, the comment was, very, was a very gentle nudge to me to know what I needed to do. Because after all, if, if the rector's office is a mess, what does that say? And so, and what does that say about how I value our property, which you know I do value? In that lesson, as I just said, it was a gentle reminder. In our gospel lesson, we hear Jesus not being critical of Peter. There's some people who have questioned, oh, well, Peter was always so impetuous, and really, Peter, you know, guys, what's wrong? You, after all this time we've been together, do you not realize it's me? No, that wasn't Jesus' tone of voice. Jesus was simply, it's I. It's okay. You will be okay. All will be well. So this week, rather than being critical of ourself and others, what if we, like Jesus, decided to be gentle with ourselves and simply reached out a hand, sometimes to ourself, as well as to those around us. In that gentle message, what we hear is, the Lord is with you. The Lord is with you, and if you are feeling a need to hurry off, that perhaps you are grieving someone, or that you have lost who was near and dear, or perhaps you feel a desire to talk with Jesus, know that Jesus is there waiting for you. God is always with us. God is always with us. We are never alone. And if this is your time, take it. But be gentle. Be gentle. Jesus was. Amen. Let us stand and affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth 
of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We are the ark of the church, at times storm-tossed and frightened. Let us cry out in faith for our own needs and the needs of the world, saying, Lord, save us. For those churches who are resisting oppression and enduring prosecution, persecution in the name of the gospel, let us cry out to the Lord, Lord, save us for the leaders of nations, communities, and households who are faced with terrible choices and whose decisions affect the lives of many. Let us cry out to the Lord, Lord save us. For those caught in addictions of mind and body, for those who feel powerless and sink ever deeper into despair, let us cry out to the Lord, Lord save us. For those who rely on themselves, for those who struggle to trust in God's beckoning word, for those who know fear before the actions of grace, let us cry out to the Lord, Lord save us. For all of us who gather at this Eucharistic table, weak in faith, faltering in our response to God, let us cry out to the Lord, Lord save us. For the sick, and the suffering in our world, especially Patty, Elizabeth, Annis, Deborah, Joyce, Dennis, Don, Marie, Jim, Joan, Buck, Alicia, Bev, Chuck, John, Miranda, Joanna, Reed, Elsie, Alice, Phil, Sherry, Ed, Gail, Grace and Jonathan, Richard, Mike, Jennifer, Kim, Trina, Jill, David, Geraldine, Mary Jo, Thomas, Caitlin, Gwen, Chester, Gail, Annie, Yannick, Jimmy, Liz, Savvy, Grace, George and Lynn, Caroline, John, Richard, Barbara, Kevin, Adam, Nancy, Kevin, Stephanie, and Dave, let us cry out to the Lord, Lord save us. O true and faithful God, we are the hope of those who cry out to you. Hear our petitions. Where there is no faith, awaken it. Where there is little faith, enlarge it, that one day we may all come to acknowledge Jesus as your Son and the Savior of the world. We ask this in his name, 
who is one with you and the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. Turning to page 360, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord, Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us greet one another in peace. Peace. You may be seated. Are there birthdays or anniversaries that are being celebrated this week? Birthdays? Birthday? Abigail's birthday was yesterday. Okay. She turned 21. Uh, Abigail, 21. 21. And uh, Melanie's birthday was last week. Okay. So let me just open up here to our birthday prayers. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. How wonderful that we can stand in for each other for birthdays and, um, and for other events in life that we can pray for each other and love on each other. And where, there's my birthday prayer. Okay, let us pray. Oh God, our times are in your hand. Look with favor, we pray on your servants as they begin another year. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen their trust in your goodness all the days of their life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please convey our happiest of birthdays. It's wonderful, wonderful. I believe our campus minister, um, Dr. Amanda Knight, has an announcement. Hi, everyone. Um, I just wanted to draw your attention to the insert in your bulletin. This is uh, for you to mark if you're interested in helping with college ministry. Um, I'm hoping that the cornerstone of the college ministry will be the weekly dinner, a weekly Bible study, weekly Compline. And so the biggest thing I need help with is feeding the students uh, every week. I've already got a core group of eight who are interested, and if we get more throughout the year, then that's a lot of students to feed. Um, the second thing about being a guest speaker, I'm looking for parishioners who would be willing to talk to students about what faith has looked like in their life concretely. So, you know, um, I'm hoping that uh, you could pick a biblical category, um, sin, repentance, faith, grace, love, suffering, and be willing to talk to students about what that has looked like for you. Because I think one of the challenges when you're young um, is bridging the gap between the words that you hear in church and um, the way that you're living your daily life. And then the third thing, the Adopt-A-Student program, that would be contingent on student interest. Uh, so I will talk to them once the semester starts and see if they want to do something like that. But um, I would pair you with a student and hope that you would uh, ask that you would meet with your student, take them out to dinner once a semester, and just um, build a relationship with them. So um, drop this in the offering plate if you are interested. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. 
We are very blessed to have Amanda this year as our campus minister, and next week I will be gone. I will be down in Sandbridge again, and Mother Carolyn will be here, and, um, and the week I come back, the 27th, I will be here, but you'll have the opportunity to hear Amanda preach, and um, I think that will I'm very grateful that she has offered to preach that weekend because that truly gives me a week at the vacation, a week of vacation. But the other part of that is I'm so thrilled that you all get to hear Amanda. I've already had the pleasure of reading the sermon, and you will learn a lot about the lessons as well as some lovely things about Amanda. So, thank you, Amanda, for your good work. Walk in love. Oh, excuse me, Charlotte. So there will So there will be no coffee hour here. Is that that is correct. So there will be no coffee hour here. So please come to the pool party. Uh, pardon? Oh, a pool party without water? <laughs> no. Oh, please no. No. Soren Kierkegaard had something to say about that. So, I'm sorry, what? Uh-oh, uh-oh, okay. We'll all be safe. There'll be lots of, um, anyway, there'll be lots of food and lots of people there, and so I hope that you will be included in that group for our, our parish um, pool party. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God.
The Great Thanksgiving continues with Eucharistic Prayer A, found on page 361 of the prayer book. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Congregation may stand or kneel or sit as you are comfortable. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord and go to the pool party. Yay. Yeah. The address is on the door if anybody needs the address to the Gantz house. Thank you.